Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth lecture and in this lecture we're going to have a look at uh, cultural evolution or cultural algorithms and co-evolution and as previously I'll separate this into two separate videos so in this video we'll have a look at cultural evolution or cultural algorithms so let's get started now one of the key strengths of evolutionary algorithms is its ability to find novel solutions you know, to rather complex problems without any bias or any guidance um, in the traditional sense or any domain knowledge for that matter. But the performance of the search can be improved quite considerably if domain knowledge is used to guide the search, um, but of course not limit the search process. So the idea is that domain knowledge can be used uh, to reduce the search base. In other words, you eliminate undesirable areas in the search base and guiding the search by promoting desirable areas in the search base. Now, cultural evolution, remember, culture itself um, is also an evolved concept. It's not that it just, you know, <laughs> pops up. It, it's, it's an evolved phenomenon. And this cultural evolution allows populations to adapt to their changing environments much faster than simple biological evolution. And it's this 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 fast adaptation that we're going to exploit with cultural evolution of course culture is not uh, unique to humans and many culture like behavior has been observed in the animal kingdom as well so for example chimpanzees their fishing behavior which is un unique between uh, groups of chimpanzees and the grooming behavior as well the way in which they groom uh, with parrots of course mimicking of sounds has some cultural bias songs of uh, groups of whales or pods of whales differ and in fact two papers one by Win and Win 1978 and Payne et al 1983 actually showed how the songs of whales evolve over time and they actually change and become unique for that specific pod and also dialects based on geographics for birds um, so for example they have found that the pitch of the notes between city dwelling birds and those in rural areas uh, those in cities tend to be of a higher pitch and that's been correlated to perhaps had to have to do something with the echoes between buildings but um, of course that's just how the theory goes but the point is is that all of these things have a cultural bias and that of course changes much faster than the biological ad adaptations and of course like with normal um, evolution uh, where these cultures start to overlap of course you're going to have all kinds of things like cross-pollination and uh, certain cultures dying out and certain um, ways of doing things uh, becoming more prominent. So for cultural algorithms, culture is modeled as the source of the data that influences the behavior of all individuals within that population. And of course, this differs from phenotype-based information in that the culture for a group, for the group of individuals, is available to all individuals and over many generations so if one individual adapts or changes the culture of the group all of the uh, individuals are going to have access to that information so that's where the that's where the main difference lies so cultural algorithms are a dual inheritance structure which maintains two search bases um, two, two distinct search bases in fact one is the population space based on Davinian principles so your normal genetic algorithm type stuff uh, that's your population space but now we also have a belief space to represent the cultural component of the population both these spaces evolve in parallel and are tightly knitted together two communication channels arise one of course influences the individuals from the belief space so whatever the population believes at that point might influence how the individuals evolve over time and of course another one that influences or adapts the belief space over time so the basic cultural algorithm is as follows so we start with a generation counter as always t equals zero and then we create initialize the population space so that happens over here and that's the normal um, that's your divinian space but now we also have a belief space that we initialize over here then while some stopping condition is not met we first evaluate the fitness of each of our individuals so we now know what the individuals each individual's fitness is and of course that is for for every individual in of course the population space and now here's the unique part the first part 
is we out of our population space we choose a number of individuals based on some um, parameter that's going to adjust the belief space so that is that is going to do the the evolutionary process for our belief space so change the beliefs based on maybe typically the the, the fit individuals or maybe randomly selected individuals or whatever the case may be and once this is done um, we're going to choose which beliefs or basically the belief space or the belief space is going to influence the crossover and the mutation of your population space so the variate is where we actually create new offspring but it's different than normal crossover and mutation in that the belief space plays a key role in that process and of course then we select the new population that's going to survive to the next generation we increment the generation counter and we keep on repeating this process until we found the solution that we are looking for okay so the belief space contains a number of components well at least two to represent the behavioral patterns of the individuals and it's these two that we're going to have a look at so the first is what's known as the situational knowledge component and this keeps track of the best solutions found at each generation and then we also have normative uh, knowledge a normative knowledge component which provides standards for individual behaviors and this is used as a rough guide in the mutation and crossover to guide the solution to promising areas per dimension and of course steer away from areas that is deemed less desirable okay so if only the situational and normative knowledge components are used and let's say we are minimizing some kind of multi-dimensional function then the belief space can be defined as a simple tuple so your belief space consists of your situational and your normative knowledge of course if you add more components this will be to follow as part of that tuple then your situational knowledge consists of all the top solutions found so far uh, assuming that you are storing ns number of top solutions you could only be storing one perhaps the, the best one found so far or maybe the top three whatever the case may be and then the normative knowledge consists of a number of components from x1 until x and x one for each dimension and then each of these values consists of a, a closed interval so a minimum value and a maximum value and then two fitness values lj is then the fitness value at the lower bound and u is the fitness value at the upper bound so for each of these dimensions from x1 until nx um, x and x Now, apart from the situational and normative knowledge, some other components that can also be included includes, but of course not limited to, as a domain knowledge component, which is similar to the situational knowledge in that it stores uh, the best individual found. But in this case, it's more similar to a Hall of Fame kind of concept that we've seen earlier. Um, we also have a history knowledge component, which stores information about how individuals change. In other words, for each dimension, um, the magnitude of the change as well as the direction um, and how that affected the fitness and then also topographical knowledge which maintains a multi-dimensional grid of the search base and it forces the algorithm to search unexplored areas of the search base now as we've seen previously with cultural evolution um, there's four main functions that drives the process and of course the first of these is the acceptance function now the acceptance function determines which individuals in the current population will adjust the belief space now this is fairly straightforward and all the methods can be categorized in one of two um, groups you could have static methods where you use the top n individuals or the top n percentage of individuals and those will then adjust the belief space or you can have a dynamic method um, which does not have, use a set number every time this could be uh, where you calculate for example the average fitness and then all individuals that are above that fitness value could perhaps influence the belief space or anything uh, along the simil a similar vein the second function of course is that of adjusting the belief space so once you've accepted uh, a set of individuals that's going to influence the belief space now you have to actually adjust the belief space so of course the belief space in this example that we are looking at only contains the situational and normative knowledge components and of course it's the same multi-dimensional function that we're trying to to minimize 
and then your situation knowledge could be as simple as just storing the best individual in the population and your normative knowledge will store value boundaries which are widened and narrowed based on the fitness values of each of these uh, individuals that you've chosen and, and this will allow for for controlled exploitation now let's have a look how this normative knowledge and the situational knowledge is calculated in this specific example okay so given that nb that you see over here is the is the number of chosen individuals so that's the set of individuals that you that you have chosen or accepted to influence the belief space then the situational knowledge is simply the best individual uh, in the current population so y hat um, so in other words the one with the way of which the fitness value is the lowest um, and of course if you can't improve on it you use the existing value so either um, so looking through all of those individuals that you've accepted find the smallest one and if that smallest one is at least uh, better then the current fitness of the current best um, individual stored in the situational knowledge then you set it equal to that individual otherwise you just keep it as it is so the normative knowledge of course stores a set of intervals and then the fitness values that that was found in those intervals so your interval itself is updated as follows we are much more progressive in widening it uh, uh, the actual belief space or that, that dimension that interval so that we explore more in the beginning and we only uh, decrease it if the fitness is better so let's have a look how that works so for each dimension you see your minimum value at each dimension j is given your chosen individual if uh, that individual's value is smaller than the current smaller val smallest value stored in your interval you set it um, so you don't check the fitness you just set it as is and of course if this is not the case then it me might mean that we are going to narrow the um, that that specific interval and that we only do if the fitness is better so if the fitness of the individual is better than the, uh, the lower bound we basically then then set it and the same for maximum so for maximum the maximum interval for each j is um, if the individual that that affects the belief space if its value is greater than the current maximum value in that interval we set it so we use that value as is we only narrow it in other words we decrease it if the fitness is better um, so that's 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 how we set the interval so that's that interval that you've seen um, the interval i and then of course the lower bound we set the lower bound uh, you'll see that this this condition over here that you see over here is exactly the same as we have over here the top over there so in other words if you've changed the minimum um, bound for your interval you're also going to set it to the fitness of the individual itself and then of course the upper bound is exactly the same so um, if if you've changed the upper boundary uh, either by fitness or you narrowed it or you widened it set the fitness to the fitness of the individual that was used to update that boundary and of course this process gets repeated for each individual that you've accepted to influence the belief space now of course once um, you've accepted your individuals and you've adjusted your um, belief space then of course you're going to use the influence function during the, the crossover mutation to actually affect how your individuals reproduce. So let's quickly have a look how that works. Now there are various ways in which the um, belief space can be used to, uh, to improve the search or make it faster. And Reynolds and Chung has proposed four ways to do this. And of course this is not the only four ways. You can come up with your own um, in how you use the belief space to influence how crossover and mutation work. And of course it, uh, in this example, um, we look at uh, evolutionary programming, but you can use the same concepts with genetic algorithms, with, even with differential evolution. But let's quickly have a look at these four ways and how it's used specifically in a situation where EP is employed. Now, if you recall, evolutionary programming um, has, a step, has a step function or a step size, and the step size influences the, the extent of the mutation. Now, one way where you can only use the normative, you can only take the normative knowledge and use that is to take the, uh, the size of the interval. In other words, if the size of that interval is very large, then your step size is very large as well. And of course, as 
individuals hone in on a solution, that interval is going to keep on incre decreasing. And then, of course, your step size is also going to be decreased. So you can use, in this way, you can combine EP with cultural evolution, where the size of your interval uh, influences the size of your step function. Now, another way in which the situational component can be used is remember that you've got with EP, you've got a strategy parameter. So let's whatever that strategy parameter is, that is then used to drive the actual evolution or the mutation size. Now, what you can do is for each dimension, let's say that your parent, the value in that dimension for the parent is currently smaller than that same value in the in the uh, situational um, component of your top individual, that you, that's this y hat, then instead of either adding or subtracting, you make sure that you always add. So you add the absolute value of the, of the, of the strategy parameter multiplied by some normal distribution value here. And likewise, if your parent's value in that dimension is currently greater, then you subtract. In other words, you, you force the individual in the direction of the current best individual. Um, and of course, if the, if the two dimensions are the same, so in other words, it's neither greater or smaller, so it's, it's equal, then you just update the, um, uh, the child individual uh, by just adding the, the strategy parameter as is. So then it can either decrease again or, or um, increase, depending, depending on the strategy parameter. So in this way, the situational component is used uh, in conjunction with the strategy parameter to drive the mutation rate. Of course, nothing hinders you of combining, for example, this, the, the, I mean, this technique with this technique. So basically, you can have your, your uh, situational component updating in this way, but then your strategy parameter could then be the size of the interval. So in that way, both the strategy parameter, um, the strategy parameter is influenced by both the normative and the situational components. Alternatively, you can only use the normative a component for both the search direction and the step sizes. So very similar to what we've had here, but now um, the the strategy parameter is, is is the size of the interval, and so this is pretty much the same as we've had uh, over here in fourteen fourteen. But now um, you don't use the the value of the, the the situational component of the top individual, but you use the values in the interval. So you check x min in x max. To determine whether in which direction you're going to update um, the, the the actual child component so this is actually a, a slight error so that should be a xij prime so the child component is whatever the parent is um, plus both the size and the directional size of your um, of your normative component and then this beta value over that you see over here is just a scaling coefficient, which is greater than zero. So something like 0 0.5 or whatever the case may be. So this is four simple strategies that can be used where the situational and normative knowledge is used. But again, it's not the only ways. There's there's various others, other ways. And I'm sure you can think of, of your own ways in which these two things can be used to combine um, the, the cultural component of the, of the evolutionary process to guide the search towards uh, feasible solutions. Thanks everyone, that concludes this lecture. I hope you now have a better understanding of cultural algorithms. Take care, see you in the next one.